color it. Good day, guys. Welcome to T Part tutorial. We are going to be treating chemistry today. Now, I today's class is going to be more of like we trying to cover up something very important, but I will try to um go from the cons from the basic of everything. That is the bonding. My goal today is for me to talk about shapes of molecules and also intermolecular bonding. That is my plan today to do that. But I'm not thinking of, okay, if that is the way, let me just see if I can also go through some basics of some concept. Let's get some information about that. So we can all be, um, I think we've already had a class before, but I don't want to do this. Let's just go to the basic, then we can able to use it in what? In the shapes of, uh, sorry, in shapes of molecules and intermolecular bonding. Now, today, we need to know something. Why do elements combine together? A very good question. Why do elements combine together? The goal of elements of all elements in the periodic table is to attain the octet state. To attain the octet state, or what? The duplet state. That is the the the, uh, the goal. That is why you see that the group eight. You can see the group eight element. Group eight, or what? Or zero. The, that is your your noble gases. If you see, you know, also, if you observe the noble gases, you see the fact that those noble gases they are inert. Why? Because they've attained that stable state. They have attained the stable state. And that is why you can see that you can see that the um the group eight or control elements, they don't take part in the chemical reaction most of the time, right? Because of that, because of that in that nature. Now, everybody needs to understand something. And what I'm trying to say today is that in every element in the periodic table, one way or the other, is either they gain or they lose electron to attain a stable state. Either that they gain? or lose electrons that attain the stable state. The metals, we want to easily what? Lose. But the uh, non-metals, we want to less gain or less share. That's what the non-metals do. Now, we are going to try to look into today. You can see the first one there is electrovalent bonding. What do you know about bonding? Electrovalent bonding doesn't know what ionic bonding. Electrovalent bonding more of like looks like what they call an electrostatic bonding. What do I mean by electrostatic bonding? A bonding that is involves um, a positive ion and a negative ion. And some of that positive ion are what? The cations. The negative ion is called the, the anions. So the bonding that, that a bonding in which there is a transfer of electrons from one atom to another atom is known as electrovalent bonding. I think that again. I think that again. As electrovalent bonding is a bonding in which there is a transfer of electrons from an atom. Such atom is mostly a metal. To a non-metal, that is what is called what electrovalent bonding. And you need to know that what are the products that affect ionic bonding? First of all, you need to know that the metal must have what they call high ionization energy. Sorry, low ionization energy. Low, low ionization energy. So why is it low ionization energy? So it can easily what give out an electron and what let the electron participate in bonding. That's why it's going to do that. So. Why you, you expect what they call IEA? IEA means what? I electron affinity. So the non-metal want to have high electron affinity. Why? Because so it can also what? Gain electrons. Gain electrons. And when it's doing that, we call that what? You can that can you are the factor that affects what the ionic bonding. And that must be done for ionic bonding to be to be possible. So if you look at if you, if you look at the characteristics of a ionic compound, you have solids, they are mostly solids, your salts, NaCl, for example. Solid. So if you if you have let's take a very good example, guys. Let's take a very good example. Let's take a very good example. Let's take a very good example to analyze that concept. Let's take a very good example. If I have NaCl, NaCl, we give out an electron to form Na plus Cl minus. So this is Na one S two, two S two, two P six. Cl minus is what? Cl minus is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So now it is what? Balanced. So what happens here? Na plus plus Cl minus will give us what? NaCl. So then the transfer of electrons. You say if this is the 1, 2, 2, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So if you are transferring, 
this will be the electron where this is the electron transferred from what from any plus we can see any plus is a cation c minus is what an anion you can see that the further is a plus or minus that is electrostatic bonding electrostatic bonding next you need to consider here also is again is the properties you can see i melting and i boiling point you can see solubility you can see what they are all what electrolyte what i mean electrolyte they are good conductors of electricity that is in either in in um, solution or molten form they are good electrolytes and they can easily pass electricity to it next covalent bond what's covalent bonding covalent bonding is what we call sharing of electrons there is sharing of electrons so non-metals because the fact non-metals are what they call iie and iea they prefer to want to share electrons and when they share electrons what happens is that they attain the duplet or the octet state what are that of covalent bond? That what they call single covalent bond, double covalent bond, and triple covalent bond. Now, what I mean by all these things, let's take a concept. Let's take a concept. Let's say I have. Let's say I have um, Cl. Sorry. N2. So N2 is N. Mm, mm, mm. So in covalent bonding, you can only give what you do. You can only give what you have. You cannot give what you don't have. So nitrogen has 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. So it has three electrons in the atom or shell. So it can only give out three electrons. And that's why I tend to compartment in bonding with nitrogen, giving out what? Three electrons. And you form what? N2. Now, guys, this is what happened. This is what happened. You can see this is triple covalent bond. So it can be single, it can be double, and it can be what? Triple. Double, for example, double is what? O, double bond, O. Single is hydrogen. So there's both chain of, of electrons there. There's both chain of electrons there. And that is why you observe that covalent bonding is what? It's present. It's present. What I can do with covalent compound? Solubility. Are you solubility in water? No. The only compound, are you solubility in water? Yes, they are not electrolytes too. They are not electrolytes. They are non-electrolytes. So those are the important kind of covalent compound. The next thing to go there is what dative bonding. What I mean by dative bonding? Dative bonding is more of like coordinate bonding. You can see what they Coordinate bonding is formed when the shared electron pair is provided by one of the combining atoms. Beautiful. So when you have the shared pair is provided by one of the combining atoms. The atom which provides the electron pair is termed as the donor atom. True. Whether the atom which accepts it is termed as what the acceptor atom. True. You can let me just really go to the example that we have there. We have um, NH3. So we have NH3. So you have NH3. If I have NH3, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. So if I have NH3, let's go that I have NH3 now. NH3 is N, H, 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 H. There's a lone pair here. This NH3. Now we can have an atom, a species, H plus. Oh yeah, H plus is an atom that you come here. So if this is going to take this, to take H plus, we can call that, we can, we can see the arrow telling us, okay, they are going to, to this place. That is a lone pair of electrons. So when that happens, lone pair of electrons, what that, when that happens, we have something like this, H, N, H, H, N, then you have what? Plus. Now, this nitrogen cell here is the donor atom. Is the donor atom. And the H plus here is the acceptor atom. 
accept or at all. So it is a, it's still a coordinate bonding, but tend to like behave like an ionic bonding. So it's what you need to know about all this. So don't know atom, accept or atom. Now, you can see that the bond formed when one sided chain of electrons takes place is called a coordinate bond. I feel that here on using this diagram. Such a bond is also known as dative bonding. So I learned for coordinate bonding is known as what? Dative bonding. A coordinate bond is represented by an arrow pointing towards the acceptor atom. So you can see the arrow pointing towards the word acceptor atom. So that is telling us that, oh, okay, that is what? A coordinate bonding. Now, I don't want to the information of any two plus ion. So the ammonium ion, this is the ammonium, ammonia rather, it has a lone pair. The lone pair is taken by hydrogen to form NH4 plus. NH4 plus. So the NH3 here, the lone pair here, is called the donor. This is called the acceptor atom. And that is what happens in formation of ammonium ion. Now, we have built the foundation here. We've talked about bonding, we've talked about ionic bonding, covalent bonding, and native bonding. Like I said earlier on, my goal is to touch shape of molecules and um, intermolecular bonding. Now, guys, based on that, if I want to talk about shapes of molecules, now, all molecules, I want to understand this concept, all molecules have their shape. They all have their shape. But how do we determine the shape of the molecule? We that means a molecule based on what they call the Vispel theory. The Vispel theory. I want to write the Vispel theory. The Vispel theory is V S E P R. Now, Vispel for valence shell electron pair repulsion. Take that again. Valence shell electron pair repulsion. That is what they call the Vispel theory. What is this theory all about? This theory is all about is not something difficult. We believe that each atoms have what they call repulsion. You have repulsion among them. Why, why is there repulsion here? Because of the presence of what? Electrons, likely charges present in the what? In the atom. Now, due to that, we need to know that there's what they call shape. Now, how do you know the shape? You need to know something. That you need to consider some things. That when you have bonding, you have what they call bonding pairs and lone pairs. What are bonding pairs? Bonding pairs, for example, these are bonding pairs, NH. NH, the bonding pairs. But lone pair, you can see the ammonia we had earlier on. Ammonia, N, H, H. You can see clearly that the lone pair is N. But do you observe the way I drew it? I'm not drawing it in, see, I'm not putting H here. No. But I'm taking it, I am flanking both sides. I am flanking both sides. What is that trying to tell us today? That tends to tell us that, oh, okay, if I'm flanking both sides, I am trying to minimize repulsion among the atoms. When I'm trying to prefer to, re, to, prefer to, um, to re minimize it, so in doing that, I have what? Spread out the atoms present. Now, for clarity, I'm going to be using some atoms today to explain this concept. The first one is H2O. How do we know the bond shape of H2. First of all, you need to know how H2O is drawn. H2O is what? O H H. So you can see the way it is drawn. Why am I drawing that? Is why? Because of the presence of one, sorry, because of one and two lone pairs. Go to the two lone pairs, you can see that what happens is that it has to flank. And when in flanks, we call this a bent sheep. A bent sheep. Bent sheep. Or big sheep. Bent sheep or big or angular sheep. Because most times the options can show any of them. Angular sheep. The next one is what? CO2. 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 This is the shape of CO2. So you need to consider that. This is the shape of CO2. You can see it. If I'm having double one, there's no how I do like to see CO. No, to be repulsion among this. But you see the way for me to be minimize repulsion, what I do, I took it on the what? On an horizontal line. Therefore, the shape of CO is what? So the shape of CO2 
is linear. Linear. That is the only way I can draw it. I have to put it on the words on an horizontal level. So it's linear. It's linear. I, I don't, so we have more of them. We are not the most popular ones there. So if you're having this, and now and again is ammonia. Ammonia is N H H. So I'm trying to minimize the portion. So you can see this. This is called what trigonal. Trigona pyramida. Pyramida. Because there's a long period there called Trigona pyramida. So there are lots of them. So these are very popular examples. You can have SO2. SO2 is bent too. SO2 is bent. SO2 is bent. You have all our kinds are linear. All our kinds are linear. Very, very popular. Things. All our kings, all our kings. Are tetrahedra. They are tetrahedra. They are tetrahedra. All our kings, our kings, they are trigonal planar. Trigonal planar. Trigonal planar. So we are, we are treating the shapes of all these molecules. So they are popular, popular. So the more you try, your, that is good. I, I, I do it every time. Go through your past questions. So when you see an atom, you try drawing the shape to minimize the portion. And you pick a name. You pick a name. So these are the common ones I've explained here today. So the next thing to consider now is intermolecular forces. So I'm not going to finish that intermolecular forces because it's half, we continue in our next time. In, in intermolecular forces, there are two there are two types of attraction in, in molecules. Yes, true. That is true. We have what they call intermolecular bonding, um, for bonds and intermolecular bonding. You can see clearly there, we have looked at the intermole intramolecular bond. Right? You've done that earlier today, ionic, covalent, dative. And you can see clearly that intermolecular bonding involves the bonding between atoms in a molecule. The involves the bonding between atoms in a molecule. Bonding between molecules is called intermolecular bonding, IMF. Very, very popular thing in the, in the, in the exam, IMF. Very, very popular. We don't joke with things like this. We don't joke with things like this. IMF. So you need to know about IMF very, very well. So, The IMF. So IMF intermolecular bonding, IMF. IMF. Now in IMF, I don't know about intermolecular bonding. Now we are looking at the bonding between molecules. And what are they? We have what they call the dipole to dipole interaction. We have what they call London forces. We have what they call hydrogen bonding. We have what they call metallic bonding. Now let's look at them one by one, based on what we have here. We, we have Van der Waal forces. But for the third one, intermolecular bonding are weaker than a ionic or covalent bond. That is very, very true. Guys, you need to know the trend. What is the trend of bonding? Ionic, after ionic, greater than covalent. After covalent, we have um, dipole dipole bonding, dipole dipole interaction. After that, we have hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding. After hydrogen bonding, we have London forces. London forces by man called freeze. London. London forces. London forces. Now, we have London forces. Now, guys, please, I want to look, look at something here. You can see, so in case of strength, in case you are asking the exam, strength of bonding, ionic first, covalent, dipole to dipole interaction, hydrogen bonding, and what? London forces. So we start with them one by one. The first one is Van der Waal forces. Van der Waal forces is more of like trying to combine um, your, 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 your dipole to dipole interaction and your London forces. So they say that they are the weakest attra attraction between what molecules. So that is what Van der Waal is, they are the weakest. And you need to understand something. It's very asking exam. 
what is the what is the cause for the physical state of a compound? The answer is intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces is the reason why we have solid, liquid, and gaseous state for a compound. For a compound. The next thing you need to know is dipole dipole. What is dipole dipole? Now, first of all, we need to know what is a dipole. A polar molecule that has two poles is called a dipole. You can look at that, that, that diagram there. I drew a diagram there. There's a diagram there, H2O, for instance. Look at H2O. Uh, look at H2O. 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 A look at H2O to analyze the concept. So now you look at H2O, we have H O H. Now you can see clearly oxygen is more negative than hydrogen. The dipole goes there. Hydrogen is more oxygen is more than hydrogen. Dipole goes here too. And we have O. You can see that this and this cancels out each other, but we still have this. So we can assume that this bond has what they call a dipole and it can be said to be what polar in nature. Polar. Now we can have a scenario whereby we have more than one of these molecules like this. So we have what we have what they call dipole to dipole interaction. Double dipole interaction are the what they said they are the attractive forces between the permanent dipoles of two polar molecules. Between the what? Permanent dipoles of two polar molecules. So when you have a between the between polar molecules, we call that dipole to dipole interaction. It's more like an electrostatic interaction. Why? Because we have what we call partial. This hydrogen here is plus, minus, plus. So it's more like you have what we call an electrostatic interaction between them here. You can see it. So plus and minus, you always what attract each other. So it's more like electrostatic in nature. So a lot of that is your acetone. And that is the reason why you see acetone can dissolve in water because acetone is polar and water is polar. Next again, molecules can have a separation of charge. This happens in both ionic and polar bonds. In both ionic and polar bonds. So the greater the electronegativity, the greater the dipole. That is very, very correct. The greater the dipole. Molecules are attracted to each other in the compound by this positive and not negative force. That is true. So we're talking about what? We talked about your dipole dipole interaction. Now, what of if this compound do not have a dipole? Do not have a what? A dipole. That means it's non-polar in nature. So the bond that involves non-polar molecules, non-polar molecules, they look up, please. Non-polar molecules is called London forces. London forces. London forces. London forces. London forces. The one that doesn't involve non-polar molecules is called London forces. Polar molecules is dipole to dipole interaction. Then the bonding that involves molecules in which one of the atoms is highly electronegative to and is bonded to hydrogen. They call that bonding hydrogen bonding. The key of this hydrogen bonding is that hydrogen, the key of this is hydrogen bonding, hydrogen bonding that hydrogen must be having fun, fun, F-O-N. F-O-N is the most electronegative atoms in the periodic table. So once you see hydrogen with F-O-N, that means hydrogen bonding is present. Once hydrogen bonded to it, it's hydrogen bonding. So example of that is H-F, H-2O, N-H-3. Once you see things like this, then you can easily say, oh, oh, okay, hydrogen bonding is what is present. Hydrogen bonding is present. So sometimes people don't see some, I don't know what is mean, if, for example, now, if I say H3COCH3, fine, because oxygen is here, true. Hydrogen is present, doesn't mean that the hydrogen bonding, no. You can see that clearly that carbon is directly bonded to oxygen. There is no hydrogen here. But you can see clearly here that you have what you call HF, HF, H2O, bonded to oxygen. We call that hydrogen what? Bonding is what is present. And these are the things that these are the intermolecular bonding. They will now have one lastly, we call it metallic bonding. What is metallic bonding? That is bonding that is, is a result of what they call the sea of what electrons. That is when you have 
electrons of metals in together, together, forming what they call a C. It's called metallic bond. And metallic bond is one that is responsible for various bonding that takes place in metals. In metals. So it's no more of like it's always talked about. So you need to know about this. So metallic bonding takes place in what? In metals. We need to know about all these things. Now, what are the repercussions of all these things? Fine, you want to know my uh, molecular forces. The point of everything there is that in, you see sometimes, you see example now, for example now, you hear that ah, ethanol dissolves in water. That is true. Why? Because ethanol is polar. Water is polar. They can dissolve together. These are one of those repercussions to this. And that one again is the fact that you need to observe something. You can see because of hydrogen bonding in compounds like acids, like ethanol, carbonic and ethanol, they what they call an increase in, in what they call boiling point, an increase in boiling point. Why? Because of what? Of hydrogen bond. So hydrogen bonding causes a lot of things. Not only, only hydrogen bonding, type of double interaction, a lot of them. For example, now, benzene will not dissolve in water. Why? Because benzene is non-polar in nature. Water is polar in nature. It won't dissolve. But compounds like toluene, it's possible for what benzene to dissolve in it. Why? Because toluene is non-polar. So that is why you need to understand all this, because this is the basis of everything. It's the basis of a lot of things that you need to know about. So guys, that's all about intermolecular water forces. So we'll stop here today, and we'll see where we can take this in the next class. So guys, thanks for your time. I really appreciate it.